All right, here we go. This is part two of debunking Aaron Ra. I should say an easy debunking of Aaron Ra, specifically on his claims against the biblical Adam and the biblical Eve. And so if you have not yet seen part one, please do make sure to check that out as it was comprehensive. And I discussed several undeniable lines of evidence for why Adam and Eve were historical. They are literal. And in this episode, I am going to continue providing irrefutable evidence for our first parents. And so what I want to do is replay a portion of Aaron Ra's anti-Adam and Eve argument in his debate with uh, Jake, the Muslim metaphysician. And then we're just going to get right into it. I've got a lot I want to get through, specifically on mitochondrial Eve and the Eve consensus sequence. So here we go. So they couldn't have been written or given or dictated by any gods or angels because they would have known better. We have sufficient evidence in science to prove that Adam and Eve are genetically impossible and were not real people. The global population cannot have been derived from a single couple, not 6,000 years ago, nor even 600,000 years ago. We descend from a particular population of apes, numbering several thousand strong at least, who set out on the road to our lineage at least a few million years ago. Okay, let's stop it there. In part one, I played a little bit more uh, from this video and I addressed his uh, claims of humans who taxonomically he'd consider human great apes and then other great apes like chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, gorillas, so on and so forth would be uh, non-human great apes. Now, in part one, I went over uh, at least two major lines of evidence as to why the data best suggests that no humans do not go back to uh, pre-humans and ape-like ancestors. And so, again, please do check that out. And I am going to get right into the Eve consensus sequence. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. The Bible's clear that God created two people, Adam and Eve, and he created those first two people, Adam, the first man, Eve, the mother of, of all living, created them separate and independent from any other form of life. That includes chimpanzees, that includes whales, that includes banana plants. Again, in part one, I went over the evidence that suggests we all descend or originate from one Y chromosomal ancestor in the not so distant past. Y chromosome, the Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA. It's transmitted on the father's side. And every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical. There's extremely low genetic variation. And every single male Y chromosome can be traced back to a single Y chromosomal ancestor just about 4,500 years ago. This is based on the levels of diversity, but also the mutation rate. The mutation rate in the Y chromosome is fast, much faster than evolutionists have ever predicted or expected. It's somewhere between one and three mutations per person per generation, specifically on the male side. If you're a man, you got your Y chromosome from, from your dad. You can derive a mutation rate empirically by doing what's called pedigree-based studies, where you've got, let's say it's the mitochondrial DNA. Well, that's uniparentally inherited DNA as well, the powerhouse of the cell, okay? So the mitochondria, it's a tiny chromosome that is transmitted on the mother's side. The Y chromosome, which I just talked about and talked about thoroughly in part one, is transmitted on the father's side. The mitochondria is a smaller DNA compartment and we get mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. And the mutation rate is 
in the mitochondrial DNA is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5 per generation. Again, very fast. Now, if you were to do a pedigree-based study, you can have grandmother, mother, daughter. Count up the differences. And what you're going to find is the mutation rate is quite high, especially in light of worldwide mitochondrial DNA diversity. And this is where I want to focus on mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA diversity directly from the secular literature. And so this is from the conventional literature. The authors of this paper, Dr. Rob Carter, whose name is specifically on it, and also Dr. John Sanford are young earth creationists. And so when critics argue that young earth creationists, they don't do real science, they don't publish in secular journals, they just publish creationist articles. No, this is a technical paper on mitochondrial Eve titled Mitochondrial Diversity Within Modern Human Populations. Again, this is published in the conventional literature. And this goes over amazing data suggesting that we have one mitochondrial DNA ancestor, the mother of us all, Aaron Ra asserts, he claims that there is no evidence for a literal Adam and Eve. He argues that the genetic data falsifies any possibility of all human beings today being able to trace their lineages back to two people. In part one, I talked about his straw man argument, his uh, uh, evolutionary creation related assumptions. That's why I went over uh, the created heterozygosity hypothesis or the design diversity hypothesis. See part one for more details on that. In a third video, what I want to focus on is confirm predictions of that model, of that starting point. And I'm going to go into all things junk DNA and uh, DNA function. Now, currently I am going through... I'm working on three major series, debunking Aaron Ra, debunking William Lane Craig, popular theistic evolutionist, on his best so-called lines of evidence for common descent, and also a walkthrough through my book, The Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook. Now, these are Patreon-first series. What that means is each new episode first goes on Patreon. And so patrons and also YouTube members. So any ministry partner gets first access. They get early access to these episodes. Then eventually I make these videos public for everybody to enjoy. Now, for as little as a dollar a month, you can become a Standing for Truth patron and ministry partner by just signing up for Patreon. And you can gain uh, early access to all of the, the, the first episodes in, in these important series. And it's a huge help to the ministry as we continue working full-time and putting out full-time content. We have endless research projects, endless work behind the scenes. And since I'm hosting some major debates on all sorts of topics, whether it's theology, eschatology, nature of God, soteriology, creation, evolution. When it comes to production, production value equipment, I want to offer our audience and supporters the best. And so your support. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. So again, for as little as a dollar a month, you can become a Standing for Truth patron and gain early access to each one of these episodes. And so if you're a bit confused, yes, these episodes go to patron, Patreon first, and then they go uh, public for everybody to see. So back to this Eve consensus sequence. Okay. So what we have is in this paper, it turns out that we can actually identify mitochondrial Eve sequence. All our mitochondrial DNA literally came from a single woman in the not so distant past. In part one, I showed a mitochondrial DNA phylogeny, an unrooted tree where we've got this starburst pattern, we've got low variation, and one woman 
okay? And I went into the details of that phylogenetic tree and why it best supports a biblical creation model. I did the same thing with Y chromosome DNA. And the data doesn't lie. The evolutionists really struggle with, and I like to ask the evolutionists, if you were honest with your arguments against Adam and Eve, you should ask yourself, what would you expect if Adam and Eve really existed? Because if they were tr to truly answer that question, how would they answer it? Well, we should have genetic data for one woman. We should have genetic data for one man. And that's the exact data that we have. And you can find this data in the conventional literature. And so this paper specifically, you can look it up again, mitochondrial diversity within modern human populations. This paper provides a very compelling description of what mitochondrial Eve's sequence was. And so basically we know what Eve's approximate sequence is. So as you can see here, the worldwide human mitochondrial consensus is composed of roughly of 16,569 nucleotides. Again, it's a smaller DNA compartment. Based on the current data set, 84.1% of the mitochondrial genome is invariant. So there's very little uh, variation, very low diversity in the mitochondrial DNA. And the authors of this paper, they took worldwide mitochondrial DNA and basically aligned them all. An example of what they did and how you can derive a consensus sequence is if I had a document, let's say, and I handed it out or I gave it to 10 different people, and then I asked them to please make a manual copy of the document that I provided each of them, you would find that each copy would have mistakes. And the mistakes would be unique to each person copying the document. Now, I could go through each of the copies and I could look for the deviants. I can look for the mistakes, the typographical errors, because nobody's going to copy the document perfectly. There are going to be deviants. And what I can do is subtract all of the deviants or errors, and that way I can find what the original document was. And this is what you can do with mitochondrial DNA. You basically take mitochondrial DNA worldwide and you can find the rare deviants and trace the mutations back to an original sequence, the Eve sequence. Then you can compare that sequence to people around the globe. And what you find is people differ only by a few DNA differences from the Eve consensus sequence. Notice this. The world consensus sequence is unambiguous except for a very few nucleotide positions. The amount of mitochondrial sequence divergence within humans since the most recent common ancestor is, notice this, quite low. And so we can actually see how far people have diverged from Eve. Living people only diverge genetically uh, from Eve, as you can tell from this paper, by only a few mutations. Now, yes, everybody has diverged from Eve, but only by a bit. Most people have less than 50 mutations in their mitochondrial DNA compartment since Eve. And so what does this tell you? Well, if you have biblical Eve 6,000 years ago, and people have diverged from her because mutations accumulate, over time, every generation. But if on average, people only differ by about somewhere between 20 and 25 differences from Eve, then that is trivial. That's a trivial amount of time to accumulate those amount of differences. This is exactly the kind of data that we would expect if the Bible's account of origins in terms of humans were true. The 827 sequences within the data set contained 2,631 variant positions. Notice this. And on average differed from the consensus by about 21.6 nucleotides. And so on average, based on the data analysis, there are about 
21 mutations between people and the Eve consensus sequence. Now, the mutation rate, as I went over earlier, is quite high in the mitochondrial DNA. It's probably something like 0.5 per generation, but you can go with a lower, more conservative amount at 0 0.1 per generation. That's still quite high because the mitochondrial DNA genome is a small DNA compartment. And so if you take the accumulated mitochondrial DNA mutations, divide them by 0.1 or 0.5, okay, you only get a couple hundred generations. It does not take long to accumulate that amount of DNA differences. Notice directly from the secular literature, this is a paper from 2022, your pedigree based rate, your empirical, the empirical rate, the observable mutation rate are reported to be approximately tenfold higher than phylogenetically derived rates. Evolutionists want to use the phylogenetic rate rather than the pedigree based rate because the pedigree based or observed mutation rate is far too fast. Now, in part one, I pointed out the fact that your neutral mutation rate, the rate at which you accumulate neutral mutations, equals the fixation rate, because there's a lot of critics that say, oh, you can't look to the pedigree mutation rate, the observed mutation rate. You have to look to the substitution rate or the long-term mutation rate. But again, the rate of fixation of neutral mutations in a population equals the neutral mutation rate. So if the rate of mutation accumulation is, let's say, one per generation, and you've got a million individuals, well, the population of one million will be substituting one letter in its genome every generation because of neutral mutations. Neutral because they are not subject to purifying selection. They are not seen by selection. They are invisible to selection and they are subject to drift. And many drift to fixation. Many are lost. Many are lost, but many are not. Okay? And so the point is, we know Eve. We have Eve sequence. And the evolutionist really struggles with this data because this data is exactly what a creationist would expect if the Bible's account of origins were true. Fast mutation rates, low variation. We only differ by a few nucleotides, by a few DNA differences from Eve. Yes, you have a max difference where some lineages have somewhere between 100 and 140 DNA differences. But that is still trivial, and we have many explanations for why that's the case, some of which I discussed in part two. And so for sake of being redundant, I will move on to another topic that I wanted to focus on, which is the Y chromosomal dissimilarity between humans and chimpanzees. Now, I talked a lot about the Y chromosome in part one, but what I didn't touch on in great detail is the Y chromosome of our supposed closest cousin, our, supposed, our apparent closest living relative on the tree of life, the chimpanzee. So again, recap. Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA. It's not autosomal DNA. It is transmitted on the father's side. For the most part, it lacks recombination. It should be a little more stable. It's certainly an easier type of DNA to determine ancestry because it's not as messy as autosomal DNA, where you have recombination every single generation, where your chromosomes basically line up exchange genetic material, they scramble. That's how you get new chromosomal combinations. Every single generation is because of rec uh, recombination. Okay, so these uniparentally inherited DNA compartments are easier to track back ancestry. And that's why it's compelling data that we can actually track back the mitochondrial DNA to a single woman. And what they'll do is look to coalescence, but coalescence doesn't work. It's an evolutionary rescue mechanism because one of its assumptions, 
is random mating. And so that way, mathematically, over enough time, people will trace back to two single common ancestors, apparently just by chance. But no, historically, random mating is not true. If you have somebody in Africa and somebody in Australia, there's not going to be random mating. Because typically, historically, people existed in tribes, they existed in isolation, separated from other tribes and other groups, and they would intermarry, interbreed, okay, within those groups. And so if evolution is true, we should not find a single mitochondrial DNA ancestor and a single Y chromosome ancestor. We should actually find many mitochondrial DNA ancestors and many Y chromosome ancestors. So when we bring in the chimpanzee, our, our supposed closest uh, cousin, the evolutionist says humans and chimpanzees go back to a common ancestor roughly 6 million years ago. You can see that on the diagram here. Now, every single male Y chromosome, as I pointed out, is nearly identical, very low variation, about 99% the same. So here's your human Y chromosome. Notice the chimpanzee Y chromosome right here. It's nothing alike. Totally different, extreme dissimilarity. Right off the bat, what do you notice? It's half the size. So once you start comparing, it's like comparing a full sheet of paper and a half sheet of paper. And both papers have writing on it. And so you want to compare the writing and the letters and see how similar they are. Well, right off the bat, you got to compare it at 50%. It's half the size, half of it's missing. So the gene content, as you can tell as well, totally different. So when you compare overall gene content, overall size differences, and overall architecture, the human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes are incredibly different. Roughly 40%, 40% the same, maybe. Very, very low similarity. As a matter of fact, if you bring in the gorilla, the human and gorilla Y chromosomes are more similar to each other when you consider overall gene content, size differences and architecture, than either is to the chimpanzee. As a matter of fact, this diagram here from the secular literature confirms separate ancestry predictions because when it comes to primates or the great apes, okay, going by evolutionary taxonomy here, we would argue as creatious humans are unrelated to any of your great apes chimpanzees and bonobos go back to their common arc archetype gorillas are their own created kind and then your orangutans go back to their own common arc ancestor well based on the y chromosomes again looking at dna data remember how, how i've pointed out over and over again genetics it's in the world of genetics that we can best answer this question of ancestry genes and traits are inherited sperm and egg not a bone not a fossil not geography but genes traits and genetics and what we find here based on the Y chromosome data is humans are their own kind. Chimpanzees and bonobos go back to their own created kind. Gorillas are their own created kind. And then you got orangutans belonging to their own kind. So here's an answer to Aaron Ra's ever so challenging phylogeny challenge. But Aaron Ra can't address this technical data. Because the challenge to Aaron Ra is how can you get such massive changes in the chimpanzee Y chromosome since the split, because you are going to have to explain the evolution of entire gene families, how so many genes and uh, so much of the chromosome has been lost. You're going to have to explain in that time frame the massive chromosomal rearrangements that would have to take place, even in light of chimpanzees and how they participate in polygamous relationships. There's sperm competition, okay? Nonetheless, chimpanzee and bonobo Y chromosomes are very similar in gene content. They're similar enough to bring them back to a common arc ancestor. You don't have to explain massive chromosomal changes between chimpanzees and bonobos like you would if you now want to compare humans with chimpanzees or bonobos. That's when you get major changes which, by the way, makes, in terms of the law of parsimony, the most parsimonious answer that requires the least amount of explanations, the least amount of rescue devices, uh, 
and storytelling is that humans are not related to chimpanzees and bonobos. Notice this right from the conventional literature. Despite a recent divergence of these species, this is, this is evolutionary scientists saying this, not creationists. Their Y chromosomes differ enormously. So not just a little bit, but enormously in size and gene content. Just what I said. In sharp contrast to the stability of the rest of the genome. For example, the chimpanzee Y is, just like I said earlier, only half the size of the human Y. How did that happen? And the percentage of gene families shared by these two chromosomes that split roughly 6 million years ago is similar to that shared by human and chicken autosomes. Yes, this is autosomal DNA and not uniparentally inherited DNA. This is biparentally inherited DNA. But the point they're making is this was a shock. They are flabbergasted. Puzzlingly, in terms of shared genes and overall architecture, the human Y is more similar to the gorilla Y than to the chimpanzee Y. Let me say that again, because this is an inconsistency as we can go over many inconsistencies with the evolutionist so-called nested hierarchy. Orphan genes, for example, these taxonomically restricted and essential genes, they lack any real consistent, consistent hierarchy. There's all kinds of inconsistencies in the hierarchy. Anytime the evolutionist invokes what's called convergent evolution, that is a lack of, a, of uh, consistency. That is an admittance into the lack of uniqueness of the universal phylogenetic tree. And so Aaron Ra, he loves to look at historical reconstructions. He loves to look at these nested hierarchical patterns. But here's the thing. He doesn't have answers to the genetic data. He doesn't have answers to slightly deleterious mutation accumulation. He doesn't have an adequate mechanism to take his fish to fishermen, to take his pond scum to people, to take his bacteria-like organism to biologists over time. He doesn't have an adequate mechanism to take his single-celled-like ancestor into a whale and into a human over time. No, without an adequate mechanism, all of Aaron Ra's historical reconstructions, they actually lack explanatory power and are therefore not to be viewed as a correct reconstruction. Universal common descent, the theory that claims all living things, including plants and animals, are related through common ancestry is simply a presupposition that is imposed onto this genetic data. The genetic data refutes their reconstructions, and so that's all they are, are reconstructions, their stories. They're not a conclusion drawn from the genetic data because conclusions drawn from the genetic data would not result in the kinds of reconstructions that Aaron Ra likes to advance over and over again. You have to deal with the genetic data. Notice this, the chimpanzee MSY harbors twice as many massive palindromes as the human MSY, yet it has lost large fractions of the MSY protein coding genes and gene families present in the last common ancestor. Show me a mathematical model. I wanna see empirical evidence, Aaron Ra, for how these large scale changes took place since the split roughly 6 million years ago. Surprisingly, however, again, this is all from the conventional literature. More than 30% of chimpanzee MSY sequence has no homologous alignable counterpart in the human MSY and vice versa. There are sizable differences that the evolutionary community must deal with. Here's a challenge to the evolutionist. Here's a challenge to Aaron Ra that argues, or I should say asserts and claims in this debate that there is no evidence for the biblical Adam and the biblical Eve. They are, Aaron Ra is going to have to apply mathematical models to try to demonstrate how a sequence can change extremely rapidly, including wholesale rearrangement of significant parts and the evolution of entire gene families in a relatively short amount of time, evolutionary speaking, yet stay homogeneous within a species. Because remember, human male Y chromosomes are nearly identical, very homogeneous. This is going to be very difficult for them. Aaron, shoot me an email with your mathematical model. 
I'm not going to hold my breath. This is 2020. And this is their comment. These are evolutionary scientists. So as I pointed out earlier, they have hypotheses because remember, they're not going to get a published, they're not going to get a paper published in a conventional journal, in a secular journal that concludes humans and chimpanzees might not, even might, they might not be related because of this data. <clears throat> no, they're not going to get published. It's their job to come up with various hypotheses and stories and rescue me mechanisms to explain the data. What we care about is the data. We don't necessarily care about the conclusions drawn by these evolutionary scientists who start off with the assumption that chimpanzees and humans are related in the first place. That is what's in question when it comes to the origins and the ancestry debate. They go into these papers with presuppositions. They're evolutionary-based presuppositions. Do these hypotheses work? And are these hypotheses supported by empirical scientific data? Has this hypothesis been tested? Notice what they say. But this hypothesis needs to be evaluated in subsequent studies. I'd even argue that, no, they're not consistent with their findings. They're just saying, oh, sperm competition. Oh, faster mutation rates. Oh, faster rates of gene conversion. Oh, this. Oh, that. I want empirical data. I want to see R and Raw explain all of the uh, massive differences between humans and chimpanzees when it comes to gene regulation, when it comes to epigenetics, when it comes to alternative splicing, when it comes to gene expression. This is what I want to see. Notice this. We identified 169 genes that exhibited expression differences between human and chimpanzee cortex. And 91 were ascribed to the human lineage by using macaques as an outgroup. Our results indicate that the human brain displays a distinctive pattern of gene expression relative to non-human primates, with higher expression levels for many genes belonging to a wide variety of functional classes. This makes sense in light of what we understand about ourselves, about humans. We're a sophisticated people. And it makes sense that many genes in the brain would be expressed differently. So you, even within the similar regions in the genome between humans and chimpanzees, you actually have differences in the way those genes are expressed. Okay? Or the way those genes are regulated. And I, I could talk all day about this for sake of... For sake of uh, time, I won't because I actually went through all of these slides currently in a uh, presentation that I did debunking William Lane Craig. So here's a couple things on genetic entropy. Aaron Ra, he argues or claims that there's no evidence for Adam and Eve. But the reality is Harmful mutations, those kinds of mutations that selection can't see. They're slightly harmful, slightly deleterious, but they're invisible to selection because they're not big enough for selection to see. They accumulate over time. They're subject to genetic drift. And remember, when slightly deleterious mutations drift to fixation, that is irreparable and irreversible damage. And the fact that the neutral mutation rate equals the fixation rate in an evolutionary time scale where you've got hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years to their so-called bottleneck, because remember, when they discovered this data that suggests one male ancestor, one female ancestor, low variation. I talked about in part one how from the biblical starting point, God creates two people, Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, that restricts levels of genetic diversity. What do we see today? Humans have low diversity. Okay, that's interesting. That's consistent with the biblical model. The evolutionists, on the other hand, they had to invent another rescue mechanism. Post hoc, ad hoc explanation and rationalizations is what they're good for and good at. And so they invented the out of Africa population bottleneck to explain the levels of genetic diversity, to explain why we have one white chromosomal ancestor, one mitochondrial DNA ancestor. So the reality of mutation accumulation actually puts shelf lives on genomes. 
And the fact that evolutionists believe in deep time, that means a lot of these slightly deleterious mutations are going to reach fixation and they're going to be stuck in place. That's what fixation means, to be stuck in place. Not to mention the fact that the majority of the genome has strong evidence for functionality. Researchers were surprised to see that there's only about 20,000 genes, uh, protein coding wise, about 2% of the genome, and your other parts of the genome are involved in regulation. They're involved in all types of function functions, okay? Not to mention in uh, the embryological development. A lot of these uh, non-coding regions of the genome involved in uh, development. And the evidence suggested by ENCODE is that somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of the genome is active, about 60 percent is transcribed. The evolutionists want to argue, oh, this is just this is just spurious. This is just noise. But again, I've said it over and over again. And the evolutionists fail to rebut this point. If this really was just junk, if this was really just noise and spurious, then natural selection should have weeded out all of these evolutionary leftovers, should have weeded these out because keeping this around and transcribing all of this useless evolutionary baggage would be wasteful of energy and resources for the cell. We've also got transcription factors, okay, which are proteins found in the DNA that regulate the transcription of genes, right? You got DNA to RNA, Trans uh, DNA transcribed into RNA flows into a protein, makes a protein that is. DNA flows into RNA, translates into a protein. And so these transcription factors, these important uh, proteins, they actually regulate the transcription of genes, okay? And um, they help to ensure basically that the right genes are being expressed in the right cells at the right time. Now, the ENCODE project discovered a lot of binding, a lot of transcription factor binding, where these proteins are binding to parts of the DNA to help initiate the transcription uh, process. And of course, you've got uh, RNA polymerase, RNA polymer polymerase two, you've got uh, uh, promoters that are basically genetic switches. Think of your uh, light switch, you turn it on, that turns on the light. Well, these promoters initiate transcription. They turn on transcription, but the R RNA polymerase actually uh, attaches to the promoter, but only with the help of these transcription factors, <laughs> okay? So when you see transcription factor binding, then it is safe to assume the most parsimonious explanation is that this is functional binding. But the evolutionists want to say, oh, this is just random binding. This is just noise. These transcription factors are just randomly binding in places. But you know what? That would just gum up operations in the cell. Because if it was just random binding, that would mess up operations. It would gum things up. Not to mention, if you just have all these transcription factors binding to different places in the genome, binding here, binding there, but it's, it's not functional binding, it's not beneficial binding, then you're doing away with the required transcription factors, these proteins, to do the functional binding, the binding that's actually necessary. There's not gonna be enough to go around. So again, the most parsimonious explanation is that the binding taking place is functional binding. And transcription's an energy intensive process. Transcription is an energy intensive process. Every time you add a single uh, nucleotide to an RNA, a growing RNA chain, you're consuming energy, you're consuming ATP. And so again, there, if evolution's true and this is all junk, there should be mechanisms that suppress this activity, if it's just, if this biochemical activity is just noise and there should be mechanisms like natural selection over time to weed out this genetic baggage as it would be wasteful of energy and resources to transcribe all of this so-called junk. The evolutionists want us to believe that evolutionary processes like <laughs> natural selection and mutations, okay? Now, of course, the, there's other processes that they say like gene flow and recombination, gene conversion, genetic drift. I understand all that. But your basic mechanisms, natural selection and mutations. You're telling me that through these processes, you can take single-celled-like ancestors into whales, into humans, all kinds of complex organisms. 
complex mammals. But natural selection can't weed out this genetic baggage. Natural selection can't get rid of all of these evolutionary leftovers and junk over time now. Okay. This is a garbage argument. It's a rescue device. It doesn't work. Okay. When we actually study the interactions between the cell, and I wanted to. Okay. So my point is um, the mutation rate. As you can see here, Michael Lynch, it's high. Okay. It's about 100 uh, new mutations per person per generation. And notice here an average newborn contains 100 de novo mutations. But the evolutionists hope that the majority of the genome is just neutral junk. And so if a slightly deleterious mutation hits a part of the genome that's not really functional, then those regions just absorb the deleterious effects of that mutation, then it's not harm. It's not harmful. But that's the problem is if the majority of the genome is functional, which the evidence suggests, then that means genetic degeneration is inevitable. Because then you've got somewhere between 60 and 80 slightly deleterious mutations accumulating from generation to generation. That's an unsolvable genetic degeneration problem. Notice this, in summary, the vast majority of mutations are deleterious. This is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics, and yet so many evolutionists wanna uh, disregard this. They wanna deny the reality supported by both molecular and quantitative genetic data. Guys, when we actually study the genome to figure out, is this really junk? Is this really spurious activity or is this functional activity? Well, what we do is we can study interactions between the systems of the cell and what we find is a lot of activity. But the interactions that are taking place, for example, when we look to, uh, we were talking about transcription, uh, transcription factor binding, again, these proteins that help regulate uh, transcription by binding to parts in the DNA that initiate the process. When we look to uh, protein binding to DNA, histone binding, histone modifications, three-dimensional interactions within, within the cell. When we look to RNA binding, these are all biochemical assays. The interactions that are actually taking place, they're having consequences. They're having outcomes. And so we can conclude this is function. We're looking at function because there are consequences and outcomes to these interactions. And remember, the genome is just not just a linear string of letters, ATCG. No, it is a four dimensional code that is chock full of meta information. It's nested. It. The, we write books that can be read forwards, but do we write books that could be read both forwards and backwards and every other letter, another message? Again, multiple overlapping codes. That means the genome is both polyconstrained and polyfunctional. And so the data is on the side of functionality. And in a future part, I am specifically gonna go into the functionality of, and I got a whole slideshow on it, the functionality of endogenous retroviruses, the functionality of pseudogenes. As a matter of fact, I have a show prepped responding to uh, William Lane Craig. That is part two of my William Lane Craig series. It's gonna be the most comprehensive show available dealing with, dealing with pseudogenes. And you're not gonna wanna miss out on that one, okay? And so, the loose sequences, transposable elements, the junk DNA paradigm, my friends, it's been overturned. But I want to save that for a future episode and also a future episode talking about the so-called hominins, which I have done a show about an hour long on Naledi. But I will want to touch on it a little bit more as well here responding to Aaron Ra. So I think that's good enough for now. More than enough uh, points for R and Ra to dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. The five Ds of dodgeball. The genetic data best supports separate ancestry. We have literally discovered Adam. We've literally discovered Eve. We've discovered the Tower of Babel dispersal. We've discovered the flood in genetics. I mean, there is a study, Rockefeller study recently within the last several years that determined that over 90% of species today originated at the same time 
at the same time. They concluded some massive bobbleneck a couple hundred thousand years ago. This wasn't based on the genetic data. This near extinction event to explain, they're looking at the CO1 gene, this highly conserved mitochondrial DNA uh, protein. And worldwide in the animal kingdom, there's extremely low variation. And so the evolutionary community, they were shocked by this. This isn't what they were expecting to find. And so they invoked this massive near extinction event, this bobbleneck. Oh, wait a minute. The Bible already predicted this. There was a bobbleneck 4,500 years ago where nearly all of life was wiped out. And we had arc archetypes, okay, two of every kind, seven of some, uh, and one human family, Noah, his wife, their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. So we have evidence in genetics pointing us right back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their three wives, Y chromosome, uh, Noah, back to Adam and Eve. And now we have evidence in the genetics of animals, the biological world, the biological kingdom, the fact that they have low variation in this specific uh, highly conserved gene, that the evolutionists are flabbergasted. They don't know how to explain it. And so they invoke, not based on the genetic data, but based on their evolutionary assumptions of your uh, rock strata, the, the geological column. And no, there's no evidence other than what we find in the Bible, that there was a near extinction event, but 4,500 years. And so this makes sense. And many evolutionists will straw man us and say, oh, but those species originated from pre-existing species. So how is that a special creation event? We're not saying this is the special creation event. We're saying this is the flood bottleneck where you have your arc archetypes. And from them, you get the origin of species today. And so say you have an arc uh, feel it uh, archetype. Okay. Well, with their pre existing DNA differences and recombination, gene conversion, some mutations, throw that into the flow, migration, isolation, inbreeding, breakaway populations, mechanisms of speciation, you can get all your different felid species that we see today everything from a lion to a tiger to a jaguar to a house cat. Same thing with bears. Start off with a bear arc archetype. From there, through these same processes, pre-existing uh, DNA differences, you get everything from a brown bear to a polar bear to a black bear to a grizzly bear. What about your canid arc archetype? Again, from that more heterozygous canid archetype, a wolf-like creature, you get everything from a coyote to a dingo to a wolf to your domestic dog the origin of species. And it explains exactly what we see in that study that over 90% of all species, including aquatic species, originated at the same time. And so guys, it is an excellent time to be a biblical creationist. We're going to wrap it up there. God bless all. Please share this around because the truth is important.